Good evening, everybody. And thank you very much for joining us this, this evening. Um, we are so privileged, and I'm so grateful to have as our guest tonight, Professor Glenda Cray and uh, Professor Linda uh, Gail Baker. So these are the women who brought us the Sasanki um, implementation study. And we are so incredibly grateful for the protection this has afforded our health workers. So it's my special privilege tonight to welcome the two of you. I'm so happy to have you here. And we are going to talk about those chaotic 17 days when you had to get everything right and about half a million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine later, uh, how we are doing today. Just as a little bit of background, um, the latest stats released by the World Health Organization has shown that there are 115,000 health workers that have probably lost their lives due to COVID-19 worldwide. And the Director General of the WHO, um, speaking earlier this week, Tedros uh, Ghebreyesus, I hope I say that right, he, he, he also paid tribute to their work and said for, for almost 18 months, health care, health and care workers all over the world have stood in the breach between life and death for their communities everywhere. And I think uh, that's where I wanted to start tonight's conversation is today we, we, we're happy to have the two of you here who actually also stood in that gap for us, our health workers, when things went wrong. So, Glenda, I want to go to you first. I think we all remember that public webinar on a Sunday night when it was first announced that AstraZeneca's plans are not quite going according to what we hoped, and we suddenly were faced with quite a crisis. Maybe you can pick it up from... Um, ...and death choices and have to uh, navigate lack of oxygen and um, ventilating people and having people in, in car parks in the rain getting oxygen. Um, so it was, a, it was a devastating thing to be... It's a devastating thing to be a healthcare worker in a, in a pandemic like this, and they've had to work so hard to um, manage the, the pandemic. The vaccine wasn't going to be available was 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 terrible because they terrible because they needed um, some protection. And so um, when we knew that the first doses of AstraZeneca were going to be for the healthcare workers, um, there was a gap, and we had just heard a few days before that that um, the J and J vaccine did work. There had been evidence of moderate of, of good efficacy. Uh, around 64% in South Africa, it seemed to work against our variant and it seemed to work and protect against severe disease and hospitalization at that time. So we had data that the vaccine worked, but we had no way of getting the vaccine into the country. And I had, I was um, discussing with colleagues about uh, what we were going to do. And um, one of my colleagues uh, from the US suggested that because I had a good relationship with Paul Stoffels, that I should um, ask him for some doses. So uh, I was uh, rather audacious and asked for a million doses of vaccine. Um, and um, when we were when we were talking to the minister, uh, this came up that I had reached out to Johnson and Johnson, and that set the the um, events forward. And J and J received the communication um, and listened to our plight and started to find out where all their vaccines were across the world. And within a couple of days, had uh, gone and fetched their vac vac a lot of the vaccines across the world and brought them back into Europe. Um, and uh, we started to have negotiations and discussions about if we were going to use this vaccine, how we were going to use it. Because at that stage, there was no emergency use authorization at a global level. So we have a vaccine that works, and um, there's no there's no way to use it because um, no government has registered it. And so um, we then uh, worked with the SAPRA and the Department of Health and um, devised this phase 3B open label study where we could continue to evaluate the effectiveness. So we know that this vaccine works in pristine clinical conditions. And um, our job was, well, let's put this in the field and see how this vaccine works in real life. Um, in the hardest group of health of people, then that's the healthcare workers. And so this is still, it's an open label study. 
and still looking at how effective this vaccine is. And it's giving us a lot a bigger reading on safety. Remember, we only had evaluated this vaccine in, in around in a 40,000 person study and half of them got placebo. So, um, you know, we have a lot more information on safety uh, than we would have had from the phase three study. So we've got data on safety and we've got data that will emerge over time about how effective this vaccine is in the field with the hardest to protect people, and that is our healthcare worker. And um, Linda Gale, when did you get the phone call from Glenda saying, <laughs> I've got a plan? <laughs> yeah, so, so that weekend, you know, uh, so Glenda and I have been buddies trying to find vaccines for a long, long time. Um, so, you know, we go back to the early days of trying to find a naked vaccine. Um, and so often we call each other, you know, Unfortunately, too often, you know, over tears because vaccine trials haven't worked out the way we On this occasion, she thought this is going to be dramatic and devastating. Um, but on the other hand, as scientists, we absolutely can't do that. You have to own what you see, own up to the data, and figure out what's the contingent plan. And so that weekend, there was a lot of going back and forwards as we figured out, oh, okay. Um, and then I think it was Monday night, it really started to uh, crystallize. I think on Sunday evening, there was a call again from the US. And, and I remember one question was, do you think you could do this? reach all the healthcare workers in, in, you know, in a study like this? And I'm like, hey, this is the good thing about both of us. I, you know, no has never been a word um, that I would seriously consider. Um, and so the yes was almost immediate. Of course we can do this. You know, of course we can do this. Uh, we just need to galvanize ourselves. It's a great night. We've done, yes, I think at that point we realized quite how enormous uh, it was. But it certainly felt like it was something we had to give up the best shot to. Um, and then, you know, it started to fall into place. And then I think we started to write the protocol probably like Wednesday morning or Tuesday morning and worked through the night um, and got it to Saturday Thursday afternoon. <laughs> and then we met them on the Friday. I mean, it was just, it was, you know, it was, we did everything in 24 hour chunks, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and found all of our colleagues have the same sense of we have to make this work. You know, there is, a failure is not an alternative that, that is to be considered here. And I have to agree with Glenda, you know, I mean, I think, I think what, what so many of our colleagues that were front facing face in December and January of this last period is, you know, they had gone through phase one um, and were tired. Phones. Seems to be that's what's causing it. Okay. Okay. So we're going to try again. So maybe while Linda's just sorting out that, Linda, I think uh, she's just touched on something I wanted to talk about, and that was that we, we our health workers found themselves in a terrible spot at sort of around you know the beginning of the year, but also they were tired and they were um, they've lost a lot of people. I think on Nurses Day this year we I was at one hospital where seventeen nurses have died. Um, so I think the uh, yeah. So I think as as Linda Gale says, we you couldn't fail, but the gate you only had seventeen days. So maybe you can let us know those seventeen days. How, how much did you sleep at that time? We knew. I mean, so we, what, what we knew is that we had. Um, so when the when the AstraZeneca vaccines landed in South Africa, we knew we had fourteen days because they had to go into quarantine. And so, um, so we had, we wanted to start the the rollout on the same day as the AstraZeneca rollout would have started. So we had fourteen days, and we lost a few days um, because um, uh, the there was a delay in getting the vaccine. So we had all the you know we worked day and night, and it wasn't just the the, the study team was amazing, and we had a lot of dedicated people who we called up and they worked day and night, pharmacists. Um, safety physicians, um, other scientists, but day and night to put the protocol together and who just basically, uh, um, you know, dived in with us. 
And um, we also had a whole lot of um, research sites who basically, we, we called them out of the field and said, you, you know, you're going to have to stop everything. And, and without any money, because we didn't even have a budget at that stage, you know, we'll pay you later, you know, but you, you know, get, you know, um, hire doctors, hire nurses, um, and we'll pay you eventually, but you, you've got to get out and um, we, we're going to start this, you know, this, this program. And so everybody, including the regulators and the ethics committees, really, um, as Linda Gale said, 24 hour chunks, you know, we would write the protocol, send it to them, they would review it, bring it back to us, we would write it again, send it to them. So we had, so we were on track to start on that Monday, in fact, not even lose two days. Um, but unfortunately, there was there were some issues with flights and um, uh, the, the flight didn't take off, was supposed to take off on the Friday and um, there were delays and we, we were, you know, scrambling to um, get the vaccine in. Remember, it's a curfew in Belgium, so you can't pack the, the whole of Africa was working to get that plane to South Africa to to deliver those vaccines. And they arrived on the Tuesday night, you know, because of the delays. And the BioVac packed the whole night. The, they arrived at 11 o'clock at night. We got the the, the vaccines to the, um, the BioVac at midnight. They stayed up all night and packed. And um, we said that the vaccine has to start, the vaccine program has to start at 10 o'clock that morning. And then I had to phone everybody and say, I'm sorry, we can only start at lunchtime. So then we had to, so the, the BioVac packed the whole night and um, the, the, the trucks and the planes flew out at four in the morning uh, so that we could get to the, the to, we had to get to Kimberley, we had to get to Mtata, um, we had to get to to George, we, um, not to George, we had to get to Kimberley, we had to get to Mtata, we had to get to Durban and we had to get to Cape Town. And um, we had to, and we had to drive to Mpumalanga and Mpopa. And so the trucks and the and the planes were waiting uh, to take the vaccines all over the country, so we could start the program at lunchtime on the Wednesday. And um, it was a mad dash, you know. And so we, we 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 took no, we didn't take no. We even you know were upset when there were when the winds, when the aeroplane, when the uh, when they were slowed down on the aeroplane, it was supposed to la land at eight, and they were headwinds and we were really annoyed uh, that the aeroplane was delayed two hours uh, because of headwinds. But eventually the plane arrived and we managed to get, you know, everybody worked heaven. I mean, so this is what's beautiful about this program is that um, no one took no for an answer. And um, whether it was BioVac or our, our or BioCare who transported the vaccines, whether it was um, the um, escorts, um, the, the doctors, the nurses and the researchers, and the Department of Health and the provinces. No one took no for an answer, and everybody um, rolled up their sleeves and 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 tried to to make it happen. And that's what we saw: an, an amazing, um, uh, amazing political will, a uh, scientific will, and and the will of the Department of Health to deliver these vaccines to healthcare workers. Yes, I wanted to ask you. So there comes a time, I guess that you know I'm born for such a time as this, you know, this is my mission, this is why I'm here. Maybe talk us through your thoughts in those days. I've got this incredible, iconic picture of you and Glenda and Minister McKeezy walking in with the vaccine. And maybe just um, tell us what were your feelings on that day? Even sometimes months or years to get something to the point where you can actually see it get into the field. And the most extraordinary thing about this was the 27th of January, we knew that j, &J had got efficacy results in ensemble. And, you know, not even a month later, we were putting the jab into our president's arm, you know, watching a nurse do that. Um, that was, I, I stood there and I was just gobsmacked, you know, speechless at the momentous occasion of it. And I remember probably a few days later, I was at the GSH site with two of our young clinical trialists, two young novices who, you know, mean about the ears, really none of the scepticism that others of us have developed over the years. And I said to them, you know, this is momentous. You, you can't understand how amazing this is that you were running the phase three a week ago and today look what you're doing. And even now I get goosebumps just thinking about it. I mean, it's, a, it's extraordinary. It's, 
every young medic should be you know, thrilled to go to clinical research if they knew this was going to happen all the time. Unfortunately, often it, you know, it isn't. And that's still great science. But this, these are the moments we live for, right? I mean, these are the, the most wonderful feeling of this is why I do it. You know, I see the public health benefit right there in front of my eyes. It's, it's amazing. I just want to say quickly, we are um, sponsored today by the Solidarity Fund. And if you haven't registered yet, you can, there's an offer that comes on the chat where you can register or register parents or people over 60, because it is really important for people to get the vaccine. Um, Glenda, maybe I, I can go back to you. Now we've done with Shusonki and I think I want to just touch on, I think I see in the chat as well, a lot of people are concerned about the um, side effects that you've picked up from the vaccine. Because obviously, however, all these other positive things that are going on, we are, you know, people are concerned about their own health. So maybe you can just talk us through, I think start, maybe start off by explaining why we haven't released our data yet, or you, are, you are when and how you're going to release your data, and then just talk us through the side effects that you've seen. Sure. So, I mean, so the, uh, all vaccines will give you side effects. And, um, you know, the vaccine does have a component of the um, of the spike protein. And the spike protein is the, the protein that um, is used to attach to cells, the ACE2 receptors. Um, throughout our body, particularly our nose and our lungs, but that we find ACE2 receptors all over uh, our body. And um, so the, the, the vaccine has the uh, spike protein in, um, and um, it does, like when you take a flu vaccine, it does mimic um, a, a, um, and affect people to have side effects. And as you know, um, and whether it's the, the, um, um, the Ad26 vaccine or it's the AstraZeneca or the mRNA, Moderna or Pfizer, um, we will see, because of the spike protein, we will see um, side effects from all of these uh, vaccines. And I guess, um, you know, what we have to do is, 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 is watch for the severe or serious side effects, which are rare, but, are, but can be fatal if we don't um, catch them or people don't detect them. And, um, and, and I think one of the, the rare side effects that people are worried about is the rare, this rare clotting disorder that's called VIT or vaccine-induced uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia, and if treated wrongly, um, can lead to um, can be fatal. And so, what we did when we when you know, and, and this fact, this occurs about one in a, in one in one one case per million that we know of at the moment. But obviously, as more vaccines roll out, we'll we'll understand um, more about its side effect. But um, if you get this, you know, if it happens usually three days after vaccination. And you'll get a, a unremitting headache or abdominal pain or shortness of breath or or pain in your leg, and um, it doesn't go away. And you know this is the time you need to alert your 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 doctor. And if you catch it, um, uh, you know you you manage it properly. You don't use heparin. And in, in fact, you know we we have had a case of it in South Africa. It was detected very early, and uh, we managed it. And um, uh, and and the um, and she and the healthcare worker, she's fine. Um, and that's and that's the important thing about about side effects is that um, is is making sure that you can um, you you detect it and you you treat it. So we've been very lucky. We've got wonderful hematologists that work with us, and um, and um, who who guide us and who've who've guided the country on the management of rare um, hemolytic events. And so it is important that so people will have side effects. And that, and this is the one we have to watch out for because if not, if not managed properly, it, it can, um, you know, it can be devastating. And you know, this and this that we need to we need to watch watch out for. Um, and um, so that's important. Um, the the other events, um, you know, so when you have COVID, um, and you and you take a vaccine, you may have an exacerbation of the 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 effects that you had when you had COVID, and we we ask you to. To you know, use Panada. I think your sister, who was uh, had a very bad case of COVID, we were worried about her when she got vaccinated, and we advised her to take Panada, which did help with the the symptoms. And and I think one has to look at a, a, a risk benefit ratio, 
um, and the very people who have side effects from uh, the vaccine may have even worse uh, events if they got COVID. And you know, people need to um, understand the risk benefit ratios and the kind of side effects that 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 one has. The ratiocinicity and the side effects are, you know, it's it's part of the immune response, and um, it's part of the you know the, the the vaccine induces an immune response, and that can activate and excite um, a whole lot of events that that you would have probably had also had you had COVID. And hopefully to a much lesser extent, you know, besides the rare event, a much more um, debilitating um, um, disease. So it's important for us to to manage the side effects of the of COVID of the COVID vaccine, um, and for for um, people who who do get side effects, also to um, evaluate whether they whether um, you know what that what the events would have been like had they got COVID um, infection. COVID infection is devastating. Um, South Africa, you know, if we have a look at our um, un- excess death reports, it's, it's over 160,000 people. Um, it's, 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 um, we, we, we estimate that 80% of those excess deaths are due to COVID, which means that South Africa's had one of the most devastating um, epidemics. We've had one of the highest mortality rates in the world. And so we mustn't underestimate how devastating and how severe um, this infection is and, and it is evidenced when we see when we're going to a third wave or even into a second wave when we saw people in car parks being um, on oxygen you know we can't forget those images because it just shows you how severe this epidemic is this is not a um, you know a you know a mild epidemic this is a serious epidemic it leads to mortality and um, hopefully the vaccines that we use will mitigate and protect against severe disease and death. So, um, Linda Gale, we we were, I think that the other side effects, like some of the doctors were saying, after a vaccine is this incredible relief and gratitude for um, what is happening. And maybe you can just talk us through what you've seen from, you you ran the, the trial at Grittiskir Hospital and all the study, let's not call it a trial. Um, at KwaZulu Natal, um, Glenda and Ian looked after the Eastern Cape and Gauteng, and I, you know, as as I say, uh, Western Cape. So there were quite a few sites in the Western Cape. So whilst I mentioned Krutuskir, um, there were there were quite a few sites, including some rural sites that we were very proud of. That we had done great work. But yes, we saw we saw tears. We saw you know faces light. We saw jubilation. We saw people jump up and down and <laughs> um, You know, I, I I think it was probably the most amazing feeling was relief. Um, and 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 we've been privileged to get just fantastic um, feedback from people thanking, showing gratitude. Again, you know, nothing for us. Um, we, we were merely the messengers, but just really. I think underpinning how important the public health intervention has been for so many people. And we just hope, you know, the rest of the country can get it as soon as possible. I mean, I think that's 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 what we're all happy for. So we saw, um, I think you've said that in the Eastern Cape, the rural sites, there were thousands of vaccines that went there. Northern Cape, we took quite a number of vaccines. Um, so do you think there's some lessons that we can learn from t- of taking the vaccines to the rural areas? Because I guess that would be one of the big challenges of the current vaccine rollout. Um, maybe you can just talk us through the experience of the Sasanki study in taking vaccines to our rural health workers. Yeah, I mean, I think that they were, um, you know, we to be vaccinated and bring them back, you'd lose a whole day of care. And so we devised um, you know, two, two strategies. One, we opened up um, rural sites so in Zutileli Hospital, St. Elizabeth's Hospital. We went to these, these rural sites and we set up um, uh, vac- vaccination sites there. And we also um, looked at mobile units, so we could use minus 20 freezers. And so we created um, mobile units to get in the Northern Cape together with um, mobile kind of um, um, 
uh, settings in a hospital, in a in a rural hospital, and these these work these work very well, and um, they were set up, and we could go in vaccinate um, people in that area, and then once we had vaccinated everybody, we could move to the next small hospital, and um, the hospitals were incredibly well um, uh, um, um, uh, developed. You know, we, we uh, when I went to visit them. They had they had addressed all the issues. They were they was they had addressed the issues of connectivity, of training, um, of space, of of in, of of how to run a, a vaccine site, and they were very well equipped to actually roll out and move into the next national rollout. So we did a lot of development work in the rural areas so that um, uh, we could equip uh, the program for for future rollouts and developing also rural mobile units also was useful because it meant we could take. Uh, minus, we could take uh, vaccines in minus 20 uh, containers in a mobile unit to very rural areas and able to vaccinate there as well. And so we did a lot about how to get vaccines to um, the really remote parts of the Eastern Cape. And that was, we did that in the last two weeks of the program where we really penetrated these areas. And, um, you know, we had to obviously, de because we were only 30 research uh, delivered. So there was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of long hours, a lot of hours on the road that our healthcare, our researchers did. Um, and when when there was a pause and um, we had to pull them out, uh, when, when we were ready to go back into the field, we said, are you guys ready? And they said, you know, can't wait. Uh, we can't wait to get back and, and, and vaccinate our healthcare workers. We kind of, these were their comrades, these were their friends. These were their um, their colleagues. These were their brothers and sisters and parents, and so they wanted to get back and um, and vaccinate the, as many healthcare workers as they wanted to. Yeah, and that's so so I would just add to this. I mean, I think the models are either you take the vaccine to the people or the people to the vaccine, and I you know I mean I think that's probably what we're going to see a mixture of that that. You know, in the metros, you can have a central mega site where lots of people come and you've got to pay attention to efficiency and lean processes. But for some of these dorpies, it was better to take the vaccine there and just clean up the dorpy if you like, and then move to the next one. Um, and and so, you know, as Linda says, we saw incredible flexibility and innovation in the team to be willing to do this. Um, you know, and every day we get the report back. I did 40 in COVID tests and I did, you know, 60 in, in felt drift and so many there. And, you know, it, it was heartwarming to know that we were reaching. We didn't get everyone. Um, when we still got a few plans to see what we can do even now. But oh, what is the situation? Yeah, I had the, the um I had the J and J um, vaccine as well. I also didn't have any side effects as well. And a lot of healthcare workers don't. And um, and um, but a lot of healthcare workers do, and that obviously does you know um, does concern healthcare workers that that um, that don't have any side effects. So um, that doesn't mean if you don't have any side effects that um, you, you you're not protected. Um, how, you know, however, we we obviously that you know we you know we would um, we you know we do these we do we do our evaluations of healthcare workers uh, along the way to 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 bring them back and and um, evaluate their immune responses to 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 see because there will obviously be people who there's no you know vaccine there sometimes there's no vaccine take and um, so we obviously have to evaluate that as well and so part of the program you know is if you know I guess um, some some of the doctors who have been concerned about uh, or nurses who have been concerned about their lack of immune response they have spoken to Linda Gall and I. And um, we've also done some field evaluations to try and make sure that we can understand the immune responses. Um, you know, we, the, these vaccines, as we know, that we know, you know, when, by the time they were found to be effective, we had data, um, we had durability data in up to about 80, 80, you know, um, you know um, 80 days and the durability data is continuing. And so, um, you know, so whether it's the Pfizer or the AstraZeneca or the A26 vaccine. It's important for us to follow up the durability and to see whether we whether or not one needs a a second dose or a, or a boost. And I see in the chat there are some questions about the boost. And um, we do believe that um, all the vaccines will eventually need a to show you know so even though your durability your antibody response may decline, 
that doesn't mean your memory T cell or your CD4, or CD8 uh, responses are going to, um, you know, you know, are not going to work. So if if your immune, you know, if once once your your um, your neutralizing and binding antibodies subside, you remember you still have the CD4, CD8 responses, and your memory C, your memory T, T cell responses that will be activated once um, you you um, rec once your body recognizes or is exposed to the virus again. And so, um, so that you know, it's important for us to understand the durability of a vaccine and the timing of the boost and what is the best boost to give. And you know, whether you give the same, whether you give um, a same boost, or whether you you do what we call a heterolog heterologous prime boost, or whether you know, you, you know, will you mix vaccines? And I think we we we'll, we won't know all of those just yet, but um, this information will evolve um, as as the epidemic unfolds. This epidemic is, is one year old, essentially, um, just over one year old, one and a half years old. Um, what's it? It's May now, sorry. Um, so it's, you know, we've, 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 it's been with us for one and a half years and, um, you know, um, and vaccine um, development has been accelerated. And which means that um, there's a lot of things we don't understand about the long-term durability. And that's why it's important for us to, 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 be, to be nimble. We also know that the virus is evolving and that um, we also, you know, need to to see whether the uh, the, the the original first generation vaccines will work as the virus evolves, and whether we not, might need to have an annual boost or um, an annual, you know, an annual vaccine with the new strain. So these these things are all unknown um, at this moment in time, and so it's important for us to realise is that there will be. So we still have to wear masks. We still have to wash our hands. We still have to. Have, um, it um, have distances between us, and if we are healthcare workers, uh, we still have to wear PPE and um, and protect ourselves because this is another another piece of um, armament in our in our you know in our in our in our weaponry, but it's not uh, foolproof as yet. So, <laughs> Glenda, I see there's a lot of um, questions now about the Panada advice. Patrick's not convinced, uh, and a lot of other people ask if this is a general advice that we can share with everybody. Was because uh, look, a lot of people will get the vaccine now. Is it a good plan? Take a take a panado before you go, or maybe you can explain to us why why this is the advice. Um, if you know a lot of the um, if you read the the articles, particularly the AstraZeneca um, articles, that the vaccine was quite reactogenic and. They were, their advice with that vaccine was to 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 either to take you know you, you when after you'd been vaccinated you were dispensed some panada. Um, panada is you know um, it's a um, a it's a an um, an an antipyretic and an analgesic and um, may mitigate some of the side effects that you feel. So um, so um, if you do feel side effects. Um, it, it, it is a good idea to, to take panada. It'll help. Um, it'll help your your the events that you you know. It'll help you um, as you um, you know in the first 24 to 48 hours if you take panada. So it's 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 recommended for you know when babies get vaccines and they get pyretic. So, all right. Um, you wanted to yeah, add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think you know. People will have different uh, levels of tolerance for feeling a bit under the weather. And so I think it's not unreasonable to wait and see if you get symptoms and then respond. Um, and But the, the recommendation is that it usually doesn't need anything stronger than paracetamol. And, and the thing you don't want to do necessarily is take something that might be immune suppressant, right? So so that's why I think the feeling is that paracetamol is, is a good uh, safe bet. Um, it'll sort out the feeling of blueiness um, and, you know, and, and not do any harm at the same time. So, getting back to another um, contentious issue, I think, is the issue with pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding getting the vaccine. So I think part of the study will now, as we do not have enough data on these ladies or on their health, um, maybe we could just take one step back. Uh, 
Linda, if you or Linda, Kyle, either of you, if you can maybe just explain to us, maybe just start with Linda first, um, why COVID is a real risk for pregnant women and what your plans are to study the effects of the vaccine. Yeah, so pregnant women have have adverse outcomes post COVID vac would would help mitigate the adverse outcome that they face, and so when you when you when you do a vaccine trials normally um, uh, uh, you you do a stepwise progression and you only do uh, you only investigate vaccines in, in pregnant women once you've established efficacy and once you've ha established um, in preclinical data that. Um, there's no reprotoxicity and there's no adverse events. And once you have that, um, there's a um, together with um, uh, um, the regulators, you, you make a call either to um, you, um, to to grant emergency use to it or to investigate it further. And so, um, um, in our sub study um, in pregnant women, we will be investigating this. We'll be looking at immune responses as well as. Um, as other outcomes, and we also will be evaluating the, vac the vaccine breastfeeding women to make sure that we understand the immunogenicity and um, and and um, and and you know the um, the safety around around it. So, um, in other countries um, um, uh, with emergency use, uh, women would would automatically have access to to the vaccine if they were pregnant or breastfeeding. And um, in this situation, um, we will there will be a small sub study. It's um, you know um, not many women that will be following up um, um, to to identify some of the immune responses and and articulate the safety of it um, and pregnancy outcomes as well. And so the, the data, um, you know, anyone can can look at the data um, and outcomes in pregnant women. It's that they've been published and and, and so it's well documented that. Pregnant women have um, have bad outcomes and have um, adverse pregnancy events and um, premature babies. So this is um, well documented in the literature. Linda Gale, you want to add something? Yeah, I would just add that you know, um, alongside the pregnant woman, we will also be looking at other very important uh, groups of interest for this country, including people who live with HIV. So, healthcare workers who live with HIV will be included in the sub study, and people with comorbidities, and then the elderly. Um, so, these are all groups where, as Glenda was saying, we we aren't entirely sure. We got some sense of it from the ensemble trial, um, but we, we don't have the, the immune um, responses in terms of T cells um, and other spinal immunity from the study, and so we'll be doing that in the sub-study. Um, and I think this is really important for us to feed back to our populations of interest in this country. Thank you. So we've got a question from um, Jacques Plessis, who's saying he's received the J and J vaccine, but he's now tested positive for COVID. From he received it at the end of March and was tested positive on the twenty fourth of May. Um, maybe we can just talk through a little bit, Linda. You know, we, we've spoken about efficacy and when does the vaccine work? When does it not work? We've had the case of the health MEC who got COVID, I think, a few days after receiving her vaccine. So let's just first make it clear it's not the vaccine that's causing the COVID. It's the, um, yeah, it's this, this phenomenon of breakthrough infections, I think is what you call it. Let's just, let's just talk through those a little bit. Sure, not, not, not any vaccine at this moment in time is 100% um, efficacious. And um, certainly not against our variant. Um, we, there's, there's, there's global evidence that there's a reduction in neutralization with the variant that's circulating in South Africa. So our vaccines have taken a expect a the, the, you know full immune response. And so we investigate all vac um, all vaccines all breakthrough infections post 28 days of being vaccinated. And it's important for us to to evaluate them because we want to see what what the virus looks like whether there's been um, viral evolution, whether the, the virus has changed, whether it's become a different var variant of concern, and to understand um, the, it's critical for under to understand the, 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 the viral sequencing. So it's important for us to know 
Um, and, and also it's important for us to understand also to adjudicate uh, the infection, whether the infection was um, severe, uh, um, critical or mild and moderate, it's important. And it's also important us to know the, the outcome to see whether um, there was a reduction in the severity of the infection, in addition to understanding your comorbidities um, and that. So, so we do expect um, a viral breakthrough and um, it's important for us to understand it because um, we, need to, we need to see whether there's been viral evolution and we need to see whether your, um, your, vir your infection was, you know, was, you know, had been attenuated because of your um, exposure to the vaccine. So those are all important things for us and important for us to understand. Um, as, I, as we've said, is that, um, you know, this is, you know, the pandemic is one and a half years old. Um, we started vaccinating in the 17th of, of February and um, we've completed vaccinating just under half a million healthcare workers. And we need to now see how this vaccine fared in the field, in the in in the highest exposed healthcare workers, and understand um, how this vaccine is working, um, and um, and how you know, and what are the what are the um, issues that we face because of um, a vaccine being in the field with high exposure. So those are important questions, and that's why uh, we're doing the phase three B open label study is to answer those questions around field effectiveness and um, extend extend extended safety so that we can um, understand how this vaccine works in real life better. So, um, Marianne Lavel, this also asked a question, I think a lot of people want to, to the virus that it is um, actually being designed to act against or protect against. Um, and so sometimes there may be a bit of cross-reactivity in terms of, say, the coronavirus family, um, but uh, it certainly isn't going to protect for something outside of the coronavirus uh, family. So I think that's important to know. So you still need to get your flu jab. Um, and, you know, over 70, you should still get your herpes zoster jab. <laughs> you know, it, it is the way it is. Um, and it's it what it's what the more precise a vaccine is, the more likely it is to be effective against that particular um, uh, virus. And that's why, you know, we've seen some breakthrough with the variant because the, the virus is, is scraping around the vaccine and still managing to keep up. Um, we're hoping that, that's, you know, even in the real world, that's not going to be too much undermined. But again, to, to those folks listening today, really, if you have had a breakthrough infection, please report it. Uh, we will follow up with you one on one to understand the circumstances and where possible to get hold of your swab so that we can follow up on the virus. So. I, I, I believe this question almost for last. Um, was there a time when you thought, oh, I don't know if this is going to work, Linda, when you thought, I know failure wasn't an option, but that you got into bed at night and you just thought? I, you, know, I th you know, I think that, that um, it, you know, it was a combination of, of making sure that um, the sites were working well, that um, the processes, processes were in place and that um, we could vaccinate um, the, health, the healthcare workers um, you know, as rapidly as possible to test a whole lot of things. Um, implementation science is, is about logistics. Implementation science is about understanding um, processes, rapid process improvement. It's about understanding how to deliver quality um, at speed, the right dose, um, you know, at um, the, the right, the right dose, um, the right uh, supply chain, um, and also not only to do the logistics of implementation design, but to understand the the, the effectiveness um, in the field on the ground. And so, um, you have to have a team that can do everything uh, from operational stuff uh, to science, and, and and that's what makes it exciting. Is because not only are we interested in in how quickly to to, um, to um, make up syringes and deliver the vaccines. We're also interested in understanding the safety and the side effects as well as the, the, the breakthrough infections and the immune response. And, um, and that's a huge challenge. And, and 
um, people may think um, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I see that people think from the comments that, you know, um, uh, this is all trite. It's, it's all about logistics, but science is about logistics and science is about understanding a whole lot of things um, from, you know, breakthrough infections, immune response, side effects, and, um, and how to deliver a service that's of high quality in the most remote part of the country. And I'm proud of being able to do that and learning every day um, how to be a better scientist. And delivered almost 500,000. I wish we'd got to the 500,000, uh, but we didn't, you know, we, we, we did have a few doses left over, but largely getting to the end. I, you know, I would say to Ben, and she knows this, we had an amazing team. We met every night on, on, the, on the Zoom or Teams, and there were some days when one was down, the other one, you know, sort of got the other one going, um, and, and that's been extraordinary teamwork. So I think the moment where we got to the finish line was, was probably – you know, a mixture of relief, but also incredible exhilaration that we'd achieved what we'd set out to do. Was there, a, was there a big celebration on that last day of the vaccine? Now we want some insider information. What did the team do when that last jab was given? No, I think we were all over. Um, it was mostly fatigue because, um, uh, you know, we, we knew that the national rollout was starting on the Monday. And um, uh, the system would go live for for um, the Pfizer, and um, and so we we had to deliver the last uh, vaccines, um, and we had to get the teams to work. Uh, my, you know, we had we, we had they really had to work incredibly hard, and so I think it was more. Um, um, you know, there was a lot. We were all over the country in all different parts of of um of south africa and um it, you know a lot of people um tried to get vaccinated in that last week and um you know we were moving vaccines all over the country we were um shifting flying vaccines backwards and forwards um to different parts of the country to make sure no healthcare worker ran out of a vaccine and so i think it was more a relief that we we um were able to vaccinate um, and uh, I think we will. We'll, I think we'll celebrate once we know, once we've done the effectiveness, once we've evaluated the the full impact of this. I think we will celebrate once we know um, we've done a good job, and once we know that our healthcare workers that this vaccine um, helped them. And that, for me, what's what's important is to know that um, this the vaccine that we delivered, um, you know, has impact, and um, that's that's why we do this work. Is, is to evaluate the impact of these um, of these vaccines, and so we that that is you know for us um, I guess uh, we haven't had the party yet. Um, I think we we now are more worried about what what is the next thing we have to answer, and the next thing is around the effectiveness and um, answer the you know the issues around the safety and effectiveness, and the next issue is to evaluate what is the boost. And um, the next thing is to to worry about the 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 how the virus is evolving. And so for us, um, um, there's never ever um, you know there's no time to celebrate because uh, we, we've got work to do. Yes, uh, then we're wrapping up now. Um, so Nagail, if you can, maybe you've got about four minutes to do a motivational talk for South Africans to get vaccinated. <laughs> What is it that you will tell them? You know, the, the, the critical thing here is to go out there and get vaccinated. Um, you know, we, we have a terrific, innovative tool that, you know, mitigates disease. And this disease is one that one really wants to fight if you can. I see somebody's, uh, you know, one quip there that if you've had COVID, why would you get vaccinated? We know that people can get COVID again. I hear what people are saying. There is some uh, non, you know, specific immunity that comes from having COVID. Um, but vaccines add that extra level of protection, um, and it works. Just of congratulations to you and your team from many of our insiders.
I think as Linda mentioned, from my own family, we're really grateful. We've also got a frontline worker. But I think on behalf of our communities, we also just want to say thank you. And I think on behalf of the women of South Africa, I think this was this was quite a triumph for for uh, uh, for your team. And I know you've got many women in your team, and you guys that are so proud. And we are so grateful for what you've done. And at least we can send our house workers into the third wave more protected. So we can just hear it for a last word from you, Glenda, and then we'll end the webinar. Yeah, I mean, I think what I want to say is that um, the COVID pandemic has been devastating um, and we still don't have um, enough therapeutics and um, we still, you know, so we still run out of oxygen. And so for me, um, you know, a, a good response to the COVID uh, pandemic is, is vaccination as well as therapeutics. And we should not ignore the fact that we have very little at, at our, our disposal. And hopefully this will be the year, 2021, will be the year of therapeutics. And we can have some discoveries in that area while we try and finesse and make our vaccines better and more durable. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who stuck with us through our sound um, challenges. Uh, I have no idea what's causing this. So, but thank you for everyone and for your advice on the, on the questions. Thank you for the questions. We'll go through them. A lot of your questions uh, will probably be addressed in the second webinar that we'll have with other people dealing with the Pfizer.